think we should get started here. How's that sound? Sounds great. Go for it. Excellent. Well, um, hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Tanner Woodford. I'm founder and executive director of the Design Museum of Chicago. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and foster innovation through design. We believe design has the capacity to fundamentally improve the human condition and strive to make it accessible to everyone through free exhibitions and events like this. So thank you for coming. It wouldn't be anything without you. Uh, a few rules of the room this evening. The best way to view this event is in speaker view. All participants will be muted except for the speakers. If you have any technical difficulties, please try to exit and re-enter the meeting. If it persists, just know we'll be posting a recording of the discussion after the event on Facebook and YouTube. If you have any questions uh, for the panelists, either use the raise your hand feature or type them into the Q&A box. We'll call on you to ask the, your question at the end of the event. Uh, we'll also post a link to download a program in the chat box. Check out that program. Uh, raising products is possible due to support from the Terra Foundation for American Art. We're so grateful. The Terra Foundation for American Art is dedicated to fostering exploration, understanding, and enjoyment of the visual arts of the United States for national and international audiences. We also want to thank Stony Island Arts Bank, our original host before we went virtual, and the South Shore Chamber of Commerce for all of their support of this program. This is the third in a three-part series. We've previously heard from Zoe Ryan, Catherine Darnstadt, Johans LaCour, and Aaron Harkey. Thank you so much to all of our speakers, to everybody that's come and, and listened in, to our, to our moderator. Uh, it's been a really great uh, series. I've really, really appreciated it. I now want to introduce uh, our panelists for this evening. Norman Teague is, a, is our moderator. He's a Chicago-based designer and educator who focuses on projects and pedagogy that address the complexity of urbanism and co the culture of communities. He co-founded Black House Studio with Faux Wilson, who's also here this evening. Black House Studios is a socially focused design firm. Uh, we also have Paula Aguera here, who's the founder of Borderless, an urban design and research practice based in Chicago. Paula has been trained as an architect and an urban designer, and her professional experience includes working with governments, universities, and architecture urban design offices, both in Mexico and the United States. And we have Obi Noazota, who's a cultural entrepreneur who is trained as an architect at the University of Illinois. He owns Orange Skin, an interior design and display firm in River North. Orange Skin is a leading source for modern and contemporary <laughs> furniture in Chicago. So with all that said, I will hand it over to Norman. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Tanner. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Obi. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Terra Foundation, um, for supporting this. And uh, I'm going to jump right in because these always seem too short. Thank you, audience, for joining us. Um, give me just a second. I'm going to share my screen, go into a little bit of uh, my inspirations. Um, um, OK, raising products. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about some people that inspired me. Um, through my time of either studying design, working in design, or just being a, a peon throughout Chicago. <laughs> um, uh, Aaron Dismuke of Misanthrope uh, was a brother who uh, has been working in design, in design mostly fashion, uh, who made a, a real impact on, I think, not just my life, but a, a number of others' lives. Uh, just because he was always in it. Like he created uh, fashions that really mixed uh, urban wear with uh, uh, these amazing layers um, that felt Japanese and goth a little bit, but were always sexy and uh, brought to you in the right way. I think he worked in this really bespoke kind of way. And this was, I'm talking 12, 15 years ago when he was developing these types of designs that we are, I see a lot in today's uh, design world. Um, so thank you, Aaron. Uh, there's also Renata Graw, who is um, just a staple, if you don't know her. Um, she's an amazing Brazilian designer, graduated. Um, she studied in Rio de Janeiro, where she's from, uh, but she also uh, studied at UIC, where she also taught. And she opened a studio called Normal Studios. Um, she works with a team of really fascinating designers in support of 
of their work at normal, but she does everything from flyers to, you know, institutional uh, 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 booklets. And um, so she's a, a real uh, design arm within our city. And I think she's uh, <laughs> really just getting started, uh, but she really is a, a diamond uh, for us. And I love working with her. She's actually done our website uh, and I'm sure probably a few others uh, but she's actually worked with, um, <clears throat> I think, uh, on a cultural level, she's worked with lots of organizations, but she's also worked with some pretty high-end institutions. Um, and she always seems to place this really beautiful um, cultural aspect. You can always see a little bit of Renata in her work. Um, another is Summer Coleman. Um, I think a lot of people... Um, don't notice her because she's always in the background, but she's really responsible for quite a few really beautiful graphics throughout the city. Um, she makes a living at this. She's done that. She's my little sister. I love her. Um, and she's extremely talented. Uh, I met her at first as an artist uh, creating uh, graphics as well as uh, um, installation work. Um, but she does everything from teas for the silver room to, uh, you know, uh, identifying signage throughout South Shore, the South Shore community and, and textbooks. Um, and then another is uh, my friend Agnishka Kulan. She runs a company called Creatia and she's a fashion designer. She's a photographer. She's an installation artist. She's a videographer. Uh, she's, a, she's a mom and a terrific friend. And her work is stellar. Uh, she works a lot with uh, reappropriating materials uh, into really beautiful fashion moments. Uh, um, she uh, has shown her work all over the city. Um, she's from Poland and she works with just about everybody. Um, and this is some recent work of hers over at Chicago <laughs> Expo just last year. As a, uh, a really beautiful uh, collaboration with Lucy Slavinsky. Um, and uh, I wanted to, those are uh, just some inspiration, and this, this is yet another one. Uh, Paula, uh, I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you. Thank you. I should have wore the same shirt. I think like, I look the same. <laughs> this is a beautiful photo, by the way. It's one of my favorite headshots, so I'm, I'm super excited that, um, oh, that you chose this one. one <laughs> Yeah, there, there's, there's, there's a shortage of good headshots. Um, this is a good pick. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really, um, I'm really excited and inspired by both you and Obi, uh, No Norman, um, from uh, our time at the Arts Incubator. So it's been um, a while. Um, I, I've been in Chicago um, for. A number of years now and and I've been navigating a practice between um, private practice um, and and now as an educator as well but this project that um, Norman is going about to show it will give you a little bit of, of, of a summary and and the vibe of, of the type of, of issues I'm interested in pursuing um, both from research design activation community engagement civic participatory processes and positioning the role of designers go for it Norman there's only a few things that impact everyone right parks beach lake the schools is one of those things it impacts everyone if you're a kid if you're an adult. And so when Chicago Public Schools announced that they were closing the schools and they're ultimately selling the schools, I thought that this was a once in a lifetime opportunity, not only to acquire some pretty incredible real estate, but to have a real impact on community, the same way that a school once did. We are at former Anthony Overton Elementary School, future of the Overton Business and Technology Incubator. So I started doing research about the closed Chicago public schools that closed in 2013, and I thought it was an important call for designers like myself to have a response. The question in place was, if they're not schools anymore, 
what are they becoming? How can we collectively participate in this process of revitalizing closed schools? We are big fans of Paula and what she's been doing here at Anthony Overton. Repurposing the public schools that have been closed and putting them in, back into practice as a utility for the communities that they live in is really important. Photographers, civic tech folks, other artists, designers, architects, students, everyone could be represented in this building. It's really great to see designers, architects, artists working in one space uh, collaboratively. This school is an architectural gem and absolutely you know, needs to be utilized for some public purpose. Using this beautiful architecture in the way that the classrooms work with natural light, but also with the visual connectivity across the spaces, gave us a really good framework to organize folks to think of their own theme, think of their own focus, but also expressing something that they felt important to talk about in terms of places like schools that are becoming something else. Just trying to be efficient and effective with materials and, you know, land and our earth is the wise thing to do. That's why this idea of like interior architecture, repurposing everything on the inside rather than creating more and more buildings that will eventually become again underutilized. And I feel like old buildings kind of tell a story that new buildings can't. A big part of it is just reinvesting in the communities because these are large vacant buildings and they really need reinvestment just to reactivate the community and make the whole city a better place to live. Much. We've been thinking about what it means as architects for us to have a kind of responsibility to our communities and how we can use design to think about bringing people together. If you working this project, is walking the talk, is really practicing some activism. And to me, that was probably the first time in which I do something like that. And I was like, this is a big opportunity. I have to be part of it. And being a, a graduate of the Chicago Public School System and you know, being a resident of this community, it's something that I, um, you know, personal. is personal, absolutely. We really believe that like, schools are the center of communities and that they're places for neighbors and friends to come together in new ways. Everyone has the opportunity to make an impact in the Bell environment if we understand that we have the capacity and the power to do so. Each one of us has that capacity and, and can be amplified if it's done collectively. We're sparking fires. I think designers, our ways of advocating are really creating open doors or open door policies in a way that allows people that have something to say that might not get to say it all the time, they now have a space that they can do that. Yeah, so this project is at an intersection of, of many things, you know, uh, social infrastructure, design, uh, participatory processes, uh, social equity, social justice, uh, but we'll get to talk more about it. And we've been working at Anthony Overton School uh, owned by Washington Park Development um, Corporation since 2016. Hey, um, I think we can end on that note right there. That's, that was beautiful. <laughs> um, let me get here. I want to introduce my man, um, Obi Wazato. Uh, hey, Obi. What's up, baby? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I like my new last name, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I like that. I'll, I'll start using it. I'll try. I'll try again. Anyway, what's up? Um, so tell us about your work and uh, a little bit about yourself and what you're doing now and what got you here. <clears throat> well, I am, um, I'm not sure how to begin, but, um, you know, I'm an architect, like every, pretty much um, like Paula also. Um, I practiced straight out of college for a few years, you know, um, doing you know i had been given an opportunity that i didn't realize how amazing an opportunity it was to actually see things a bit different than you know the discuss and things that we got through you know uh, university uh graduating i um i mean well after after my after my stint working you know doing my um my 
Paula, would you call that service? That would be great. Yeah, like you, <laughs> uh, you know, you do. <laughs> uh, corporate service? I don't know, yeah, just kidding. Service, you know? So um, then I decided to go to the street. Um, and if you, at the time, it's, it's interesting because um, a lot of the catch phrases and the things that we bandy around today, um, once upon a time, these things didn't quite exist. And those opportunities weren't there for us to even understand um, um, the dynamics of a community and, you know, the participation of uh, different cultures, you know, as to, as to uh, what um, makes up a city. And um, we found ourselves at a time in Chicago uh, creating this experience called Wicker Park. Of course, not the Wicker Park of today, but the Wicker Park that gave rise to what it is today. Uh, and uh, it was a confluence of some of the most amazing, beautiful people, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, that came from all walks of life, you know, uh, be it in art, design, fashion, music. Um, and then the, uh, the support, the supporters, who are the people that actually soaked it up and inspired and gave all the energy. And so uh, for me, it was a no brainer that uh, the world of architecture, you know, the, 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 um, the, the holy grail or the things, you know, the way we've been taught that architecture must be practiced was a box that didn't quite define or didn't have room for every participant or didn't have room for all of us to actually um, um, uh, include our voices and make it a, more, a far more richer experience. And so not having anything to look up to, we had to design it. We had to create it ourselves from scratch. And so for me, the, uh, the way forward was I now became my own client. And through becoming my own client, it gave me the license to now go outside of the box of architecture to start to explore all kinds of things that are of deep interest to me, you know, be it fashion, be it music, uh, be it um, design, um, graphic design, you, you name it, you know, all that stuff actually all of a sudden made sense. And, you know, being able to bring it all together was for me as human as I could possibly be because as a person your interest you know one day you're listening to blues the next day you're listening to a bit of a country the next day you're listening to hip-hop and yet you're the same person and so you know to me life also had to continue in that format and hence you know uh, that's pretty much the story of my life and um, you know of, of course not being an American um, I came from Nigeria I grew up English and so, you know, and then I schooled, I finished up my studies here in the United States. And so people go, so um, how do you define yourself and who are you? And to me, I am a summation of all these different experiences. And in these different experiences, I also see life in that format. And hence, you know, um, what one might call classic traditions of practice of architecture, I think um, is a definition that we all have a say in what that becomes. And as having a say in what that becomes, it means it also has, it becomes a democracy, which unfortunately is in the practice of architecture. And yeah. I think Paula, you understand what I mean when I say that. Yeah, this is, this is. That's, so, that, that's it, that's it though, I'm done. That's super. Um, thank you, Obi, thank you, Paula. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out a couple of questions and then, and, and you can freely speak to those. Um, and then we're going to open up for questions because normally this, this uh, just goes by really, really fast. And I think one that's interesting um, and kind of combines both, uh, both your practices, um, and it's from uh, a friend, Abire, and <clears throat> it is, is designed to fulfill a purpose or to make a profit? And how do we balance the line? And I think this is great for a lot of the projects we work on because when you're working for a community, I think uh, you you sacrifice the the architect's fee and you sacrifice the designer's fee on the front end. Uh, um, 
and and so I'm gonna let you guys speak to that. No pressure. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I it's I'm I'm gonna try to answer in a different way because um, well a couple of things I think you know the practice of architecture. It's, it's rooted in a training that is very transactional, right? As students, you are taught you're gonna have a client and you know, you're gonna have this bi-additional thing, um, exchange, you're, gonna, you're connecting expertise with need and whatnot. So that's a paradigm, like we operate in that way. And then when you go out and you don't wanna be in that way of practicing like like Ubi said like he became his own client like I had to re yeah. come to that realization that you know it's it's the the, the work that I want to produce there's not no one asking for it there doesn't make sense that I produce it anyways um, the answer is yes but the other point I want to make um, is that we we think very narrow in terms of currency right Cur uh, currency is not only uh, financial like resources like our relationships our social capital networks, like that project that I show, I wouldn't have been able to do a 1% of it if it wasn't for all the people that poured their creativity and time and energy and, and resources and connections. So I think we have um, to expand the way that we think about um, currency and capital, right? And I think architecture design um, designers, like you said, have a a really, really interesting way of thinking about it, like just overcoming those barriers really quickly, um, creating something from almost nothing all the time, um, and being really uh, bold while using resources in a very nimble way. So I, I would say, you know, I, I think in, in a way, um, you know, Borderless, when I started Borderless in 2016, <laughs> I registered as an LLC, as a for-profit company, because I, I didn't know better. <laughs> <laughs> and you know but it, it it kept me from um like thinking immediately that i had to be in the nonprofit world and that was i think that was very healthy kind of going through that struggle of not knowing what would that mean and trying to think like how can the services that i'm interested in in, in providing become something that i can um, be compensated yeah. for so i think profit and compensation are very are different um so we can also talk about that yeah. Obi, what you what you think about? Well, I am. Um, see, I I peep my head into that world of what you, you know, the one you ended up in, and I ran for my life. See, because um, I need that to still pay my rent somehow. Ooh. And so, you know, you find out that um, this transaction that requires for you to be completely generous with your, with your entirety is actually um, us, I don't know the word for it, as, um, as, as noble as that might be a course. The reality is uh, society is full of um, suction pumps little little suction pumps that will suck you to the <laughs> driest point you can ever imagine to be sucked you know and so to me that has always give us an example of that sorry <laughs> give us an example oh my god we live it every day you know uh, you tell a client you know like a i mean because you see the, the truth is as you see as architect we are, you know, they say the first profession or the oldest profession in, in life is uh, that of the prostitute. It should be the oldest protect that, that prostitute is actually the architect. Oh. See, we are, a client comes along and says, okay, um, I'm looking to do this stuff. You get all excited. You sell them on this amazing idea and all what that cost you a billion dollars. And then he's like, well, I only have $10. Okay, that's <laughs> You should have told me that at the get-go. The beginning. <laughs> yeah. And so it's such a very funny thing. You know, you know, when I listen to you say, you know, the whole thing about transactions, I'm like, oh, yeah, I know, I know a, a thing or two about that. <laughs> now, you know, so to me, though, um, well, there's also a boldness 
I think, in also recognizing that um, you also have a very critical point in this conversation. And um, the, the critical point also has to do with um, a clear understanding of this transaction that you speak of, this finance. Mm -hmm. and we are also capable of actually um, creating something out of nothing. Mm. Yeah, I think we're... we're um... And to me, that's a very important thing to appreciate what that means. And today, actually, people, the people that technology has actually helped enlighten us in those situations where I give away so I could become. So Facebook gave for free to become. Yeah. Everybody, give, you know? Yeah. And that is something that we as architects have not learned how to actually, you know, um, put together this package that we've always been a part of for so long. Because yeah. we've always had no problem to giving everything. Yeah. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to segue into a, one other question. And then I think after that, it'll probably be time for Q&A. Um, historically, design history has shown us that American and European men lead the industry of design. Today, we need to influence the new generation that they too should be a part of this growing industry. This new, this new generation responds with a question. Why should I be a part of that white industry? They don't want me there. As design professionals and community members of this city of Chicago and the world, how might you advise a young person seeking answers to this question? Um, Paula or me? You start this time, yes. I start this time, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I pass you the ball. But I, can, I, can I just say something really quickly? Um, when, I, when you were talking about your identity, I think that's, it's kind of connected because um, you, know, you said uh, you, you came to Chicago not being a US citizen. Like, I, that resonated with me tremendously because you're trying to find like, what, is a what, is, what is a platform? Where is a, what is a table where I can do these things? that are um, very layered, right? Identity-wise, but also culturally-wise and, and you know, ideologically. Um, so I, I just wanna speak, I just want us to make a moment to reflect on that at some point because I, I think that's, that's, that's the beauty of the Midwest, right? We were talking about like this being a very interesting and important territory and-, and Actually, it and might be, like we said the last time, it might actually be, in my, in my observation of Americana, the Midwest, is actually the true Americana. Yeah. You know, the coasts, you know, New York, LA, Miami. Like I said, Miami is South America. New York is the rest of the world, you know? It's not Americans. LA, that's, that, those are film tricks. That's Hollywood. <laughs> and so, you know, when you really wanna talk about America, this is where it's at. And so the fight, or the, or the, yeah, the fight, the war to elevate American taste and all that stuff is wasted on New York, is wasted in LA, it's wasted in Miami. This yeah. is where it's at. And for this to be done here, and, 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 and you, know, you know, this is where the war is and this is where the victory lies. You get this place, you've got America. Yeah. And that's something I've always understood and that's part of why people say, so why are you in Chicago? New York doesn't need me. LA doesn't need me. They have them. But this is where it's at. But anyway, this actually goes back, goes down to this question you're asking, Norma, mm -hmm. about uh, the European um, uh, hegemony on, on design. Well, that's, again, you know, uh, from whose opinion? I guess that's part of the question. You know, whose opinion are they that? Because there's a whole continent, or should I rephrase that? There's a country called Africa, because you know the rest of us in the world don't ref refuse to accept that Africa is actually a continent that actually has a storied history of design, ingenuity, um, you know, uh, through eons and eons 
of, an, of let's just say, through a lifetime of understanding nature and her natural laws as a way of actually uh, being, um, uh, you know, well, I want to use words like conservation, all kinds, you know, all, all the really beautiful words that we use these days. The point is, that question to, to, to hold its value means that you have to negate the contributions of others that are not of a particular race. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I think that's a problem in itself already. Because, you know, for the person being told, oh, but you should come join and put your voice in this person's um, space. Well, you are going to feel a threat because you're an outsider in someone else's space. The question should be positioned that there are all these different spaces that we all each champion and we now actually contribute to this pot called humanity. And it's all these different things that actually make it richer. So from that perspective, this person that you're now telling has a sense of responsibility, has a sense of, you know, uh, you're, he's been emboldened and enabled that your voice is actually critical and it's missing. Not, oh, should we, okay, this guy has always has a hedge money, you should go join them. No, I don't want, you know, that's, I think uh, that's where, I think that question is, a, you know, that, that's my position on that, actually. Yeah. yeah, like how do you create space in a, in a context that is very dominated, right, by one narrative? Um, I, I like to think about it in like there's not enough voices, right, in, in, in any process to take a decision. And, and I, I feel that's why in many ways my practice is rooted in that, like bring people together. We need to figure out this uh, collectively. And number one, because I think there's this very, very arrogant assumption um, culturally that there's one voice that needs to be like that should be dictating how we build spaces, we shape spaces, you know, who feels comfortable where. Um, so I think for me, that's a very important part of, of, of my practice because I'm trying to make room. I'm trying to, to make the case that it's valuable, it's important that we uh, make, um, that we invest energy, you know, in, in, in making the space for creating the things that we wanna see realized. Um, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, it's, it's not easy. Um, it's, you know, it creates a lot of, there are a lot of barriers um, and it's um, oftentimes disappointing. And, you know, we have these great ideas and, and ambitions, right? Also as, as people of color. And when, see, when we see all the systems that we have to overcome to make a little tiny microscopic dent in the way that things work, it is, it is, it is exhausting. But um, I think that's where this conversation is very important because just making the connection, connecting across the people that are doing this efforts in different, in different practices and different kind of fronts of action, um, we start learning from each other, right? Like we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There, there's, there's knowledge that collectively in, in, in collectivity that um, kind of amplifies um, the, the, the effort to overcome the struggle because it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, okay. And, and, and just to actually add to what Paolo said, you know, um, I like when she used the word, it's exhausting. <laughs> really, it really is. Actually, it is. Oh, it's exhausting. <laughs> That's why I'm drinking my beer yeah. right now. <laughs> you know, you know, cheers to everyone too, I've got my gin. Yeah, nice one. But anyways, um, no, but in the exhaustion, you know, um, there is also a curiosity mm -hmm. and that curiosity if you've ever rolled out of bed and decided i'm gonna go on vacation to mexico or i'm gonna go on vacation to paris i'm gonna go on vacation to xyz the fact that you're curious and you've gone to a place to admire the idea of the other is also an affirmation that the other is also part of a reality that completes you. And if that's that, then that question, you know, becomes, you know, a very interesting question. Yeah. Because 
It's the absence of that which completes us that allows for such questions to actually exist. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, um, and, I, and I, I'd like to ask this, this is not on my list and it's, it's a little out of place, but- Are you going off script? I'm going a little off, off the script, yeah. Uh, did, uh, did architecture tell you to, to think about community in school? Like, was, this a, was there moments where your research insisted upon you talking to the communities that you're building for? No, uh, no, uh, but I think, so I, I joke with, uh, with Dennis, my husband, that um, I always been some form of, I've always done this form of community service. I think it's just in my DNA, you know, I was the, the class organizer in sixth grade, like this, let's put the party together. So I, I, I think there's something like DNA related because I, you know, I, as, as a student, I always been organizing and like thinking of like, how can we do things beyond how I tell my students, like, think beyond, beyond your property line, right? Like, how can this, how, what you do can um, just benefit others other than yourself? And right. that consistently, you know, that, 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 that also became really clear to me uh, once out of architecture school, my second job was working with government. And, you know, being in public service was like mind blowing for me, understanding that there's other ways of practicing architecture that was never in my radar. Um, so no, there's, I mean, still, there's no nothing in, in architectural training that helps you to understand um, like the value of community and designing processes and, and whatnot, like not even like, you know, it's, 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 it's something that I try to teach, but um, you know, it, it, it's hard. It's really hard because it, you're, you're again, like this little element in an iceberg of, of a lot of content that's, that um, other students are receiving and you know, it's, it's, not, it's not balanced. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think there's, there's not enough of that. And there's a realization and I think some schools are making steps and efforts to, to hire faculty and just integrate folks that are doing like the work that you all are doing. But it's just not enough or still like very like white centric. So yeah. like little efforts here and there. Yeah, you know? definitely. Um, Eric has a question for you, Obi. Eric Williams. Hi, Eric. Oh. Ready? Oh my God. <laughs> oh, hey, what's up, man? What's going on? Oh my God, hey. Eric. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm listening to you, bro. Oh. Sorry about that, I was in my car. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. What's up, Obi, Paula, everybody? Hi, Eric. Hey, hey. So I just wanted to say uh, two things. Number one, I want to say thank you to everybody on this, uh, on this panel. I've been inspired by everybody who, uh, who was on here, so thank you for that. Um, Obi, you, I, I never told you this or not, but you were the inspiration. One of the inspirations for me opened up the Silver Room in Wicker Park. <laughs> oh, my God. Because I drove down Milwaukee Avenue, and I saw this place called Akno. I'm like, man, what the hell what is, is this? This? <laughs> this is like a, a crazy looking place. It's way, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't fit, but I love it, you know? So it made me realize that I could create something that was a little bit different. Wow. Uh, so, so, so thank you for that. And you also did uh, the restaurant, Square One, that, that I had. So yeah. thank you for that also. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, a place like Akno, and where could that space be now somewhere on the south side that could be that same kind of inspiration that's kind of out of place, um, that's ahead of its time? And would you, who would take a risk on building that kind of space? You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, is, that, is that even possible nowadays? Eric, can I ask you to describe Akno for those who weren't there in the, in the Wicker Park times? Sure. Uh, oh, but you should describe Akno. It, it, it was a restaurant. It was a restaurant, it was a but it was much more than that because it was highly designed. Yeah, it was, it was a very small, designed. a small little thing about Akno, and then Eric can describe what it is. Akno, or oh, see, see, today we take for granted that you can go into a space and you have, um, you know, you expect to have this uh, union between. You know, um, um, say a restaurant, a DJ, a sonic, you know, like the union between the visual and the sonic. Pre-Akno, 
we didn't really, you know, the DJ's position was like hidden out, you know, he wasn't important. He was just some guy who, okay, we're just going to feel sorry for him. We're just going to pay him five bucks and just sit there and just spin some music. You know, he was never brought into the center of what, you know. And so these, those were days of experimentation. And so we experimented with things that we mm. believed in. And some of them worked out and they became normality that today people don't realize there was a, a point zero where it all started. Okay. So, you know, part of what Eric is alluding to, some of the things and experiments that we were doing. Um, but Eric, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm listening. Yep. Okay. So the question about, you know, can Okno be done again? Yes. Okno can be done every day. And that's not, um, you know... Um, it's not, it doesn't reside in a moment in time or whatever. The, the reality is that the South side is, in my opinion, pregnant with opportunities. And um, there are people, you know, and, and, and I think part of the neglect is also, um, it's also from a position of having bought into stereotypical ideas about community or certain community. And it would take not outsiders, but actually members of that community that have actually been, um, and let's just say have been, uh, have, uh, have had the privilege of actually experiencing the world of the other Mm -hmm. to bring that back home I see this is what my eyes have seen and i think it's good Let's yeah. go. i'm wondering paula if you can speak to that a little bit i mean i know not not so much um about Agno. <laughs> about Agno, but about you know spaces that you're creating uh throughout all parts of chicago and 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 the world uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, I mean, and Eric is the master of this, right? Like, how do you create community even, like, creating a place? Um, and, you know, I think that's a, I think there's a, there's a part in the timeline of um, this project um, that it's missing. It's missing in terms of investment and, like, real resources, right? We all kind of do it, like, like hustling and try to make this things happen, but it, it doesn't exist in a performa, like in, in development of, of, of projects. So um, this, build, this building community part, right? That takes, that's where you meet, you know, who has um, the cousin DJ or who has the amazing artist or the, the cook. And, you know, that's where you start assembling a team. And uh, I think that's, that's much, that's equally important as part of like, given birth and you know like assembling teams and and identifying who you want to work with i you know i i find that you you know you meet a lot of people in very interesting ways when you work along with them um mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what type of project it is it could be you know for me it's like painting maps in a parking lot or like activating or you know, organizing and like you meet people very interestingly by working with them in, in, in many different ways. So, um, and then you find, you know, partners that you wouldn't imagine it, they, they will be there. So um, the joke I make is that, you know, at the hallways of Overton, people have met and now they're, you know, doing projects like outside of the school. Okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's all about like finding the space for that interaction and, and level of, of collaboration interaction and collaboration to happen yes yeah. just, just just real quick before we jump away because uh, eric you're still there right yeah yeah i'm here uh-huh okay um i want to kind of stress something because uh, paula there's a part of what you've said but there's also a part that i think is also important also when the audience and i use the word the audience the participators not you know because you have the people that create they have the people that consume you know, so the chef makes the food and then, you know, those of us have to believe in his skills, also comes to the restaurant to eat and buys, you know, and then that allows him to eat more and blah, blah, blah. So community also needs a sense of belief. Mm -hmm. The belief in the 
possibility of a possibility. Yeah. yeah. You understand? You know, sometimes it's impossible right now, but to, through sheer determination, it's possible tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that is something that when you are, when you can sense that, then a lot of things now open up. And that is something that, you know, I think, you know, um, we find that, you know, where good ideas die, because you don't have that, 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 that thing that can ignite. Yeah. Hey, Obi, I got two more questions. Uh, one from Aaron Dismute and another from Sebastian. And if we can get to Iber's, uh, uh, Iber's uh, question under that, I have three questions. So here's Aaron. Uh, did I just let you in, Aaron? Yeah, there he is. You're muted, though. One second. Aaron? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. OK. Uh, so far, what a great, great meeting. I'm just sitting here listening in. It's amazing. All your great minds working together. I love it. Um, and thank you so much for the call out as well. That was- Thank you for joining. Like I said, man, you, you, you guys, all of you in your own unique ways are kind of an inspiration to me as well. Um, Obi, I've known you for so, so long. And uh, you know, my question really to you honestly was like, you know, I've, I've been privy to a lot of your projects throughout the time that we've known each other. And, um, you know, there's a certain, like, there's a certain, like, DNA, there's a certain ethos that you have that for each of your projects, it's almost like you leave a fingerprint upon those, upon those projects. And there's, you know, there's, a, there's, I mean, there have been so many times I've brought people from other places in the world and we've like, we've sat down in Akno, we've sat, we've, I've taken them to Orange Skin, I've taken them to, you know, whether it was Octopussy, whether it was any of your other projects, and right off the bat, these guys were like, oh man, this design looks just like your, your one friend you introduced me to. And there, there's a certain thing, there's a, cer there's a certain thing, a certain characteristic that you have. It's like something that kind of, you know, it's almost like a, you know, every artist leaves a part of themselves in their work. And there's a certain part of it that you have seen to weave in or weave or ingrain into that project. Um, can, I mean, can you speak a little bit about that? Because there's something, I mean, every artist does it, we all do it, but there's visually, and you're, you know, when you really look at your, a lot of your work and maybe you don't notice it, but most architects are really visual. They're very visual, visual artists. And can you touch a little bit about like, what it is, what, what is the web you weave that in your end product, in, the, in those building blocks, you can see your name etched into it? Like what, it's, it's your Banksy moment. What, what, what is that? Um, Aaron, wow, okay. <laughs> you know, but um, actually this is really cool. You know, cool, I mean, um, Tana, I have to say, you know, uh, you guys, figure out what's going on here because it could be a dna for like any future you know kinds of uh, events like this where you have people actually in the q a are like the roll call of like the who is who of what actually changes a city you know I was so when, that. it's, it's pretty cool place, you know to have aaron to have uh, eric you know talking um which is a, quite a lot of history, actually. Uh, <laughs> that's for another day. I got okay. two more questions um, for you, Obi. Let's go, man. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> just, just, real, just real quick. Okay, so, Aaron, I, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I, I think it's difficult for one uh, to, to be an observer in the middle of actually, you know, ejecting things out of yourself. You know, so I think other people, it's, it's easier for them to see mm. and to connect the dots than for me to see. But one thing I do know is that um, what has always pushed me was my ignorance of knowing that I was in the Midwest. Very true. Very I was right. completely I get ignorant to that. So I, I treated where I was to be, I, was, I could have been like I'm in Tokyo or I'm living in London or I'm living in New York. And I treated it that way. 
And so you find out that your competition was no longer restricted to locality, but mm -hmm. now your competition was at the level of, you know, if it's, you know, what, what are the best minds out there? That's what I compete with. And yeah. so in so doing, you know, you're learning at such a fast and furious uh, pace. But at the same time, you're now forced to eject out of you things that you don't even know exist because you would never have known if you, if, you're, if you didn't find yourself in such awkward positions. So anyway, so that's the only way I can explain um, uh, uh, for me what, so what, what was my passion. Obi's email address, so we can, uh, and, and Paolo's email address. So can, no, literally, I really want these questions answered. So the last three questions are, and I'm gonna start with Ella, and then I'm gonna go to Ellen Alderman. Ellen's uh, studying at the university in England, and she wants to know, what are the best tips for students? Okay, the next question. I love what you all are saying about cultivating communities in order to create access or to access. Uh, excitement and engagement, the collective resources connection. Any thoughts on how we can continue to grow these spaces for connection and growth now and in the next year? Thank you, Ellen Alderman. And the last question, I'm gonna let y'all wrap it all up. Uh, this is from Daniel Ar Arizaga. Uh, design tends to take, shoot, somebody added another question. Design tends to take a back seat. Uh, how, do we, how do you help bring more sophisticated design thinking to an audience that may not value it or see it as, see it the way someone else sees design? as the focal point for any solution who knows design is integral to step one. It seems audience and stakeholders may see design as a frosting on the cake instead of part of the, what makes it better. That's correct. Yeah, I, I rage often because I don't know if we're gonna, to be honest you all, I don't know if we're gonna be able to address all the questions, but I get, I want to share something that you probably, many of you have experienced in conversations. Like I, I, I work in a lot of planning projects or so urban planning. So I'm in the early stages of a lot of this um, kind of architectural projects before they are architectural projects. And, and what I hear often is, you know, we'll bring the, we'll bring the, the designers and the architects when we have to make things pretty. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, 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 it's raging, right? And, and I think, my reflection after I come back from that state, um, my reflection is, you know, trying to, well, number one, continue to participate in those spaces because a lot of decisions are made there even before the, they, people realize there's a design opportunity or it's a design problem. Um, and, and secondly, I think, you know, we all have our very different ways of, of arguing for how design brings value to different things not not financial value necessarily but like how things how the design has the capacity and the power to make things better um so i don't know i i just keep trying i i keep um you know bringing that part um like the value of design and and in making things better in different spaces, whether it's a community meeting, whether it's, you know, with my friends that are not designers, whether it's, it doesn't matter. It's like, it's my, it's my steward role in every place that I, um, that I have the opportunity to be part of and every table that I'm able to, that I'm available to, or, or I have the opportunity to sit in. Okay. So I'm going to pick back off of what you just said. Um, design for me, um, uh, like the second person or the last person I asked the question about uh, why clients don't understand the value of design. Design actually, to me, is actually the most efficient solution to all transactions, actually. Design to me, it's like when we say, if, you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Design. The problem with it is that it is so easy that we don't see the value in it. Oh. So we want to add more garbage to now feel it. And it's in that garbage that you add that you now actually use up the whole idea of that simplicity because it's too, it's too simple. Yeah. 
you know, for a lot of people to actually to see that that's actually, that's where it's at. Imagine the human mind. Today, we live in a world, you know, where we're constantly trying to upgrade our memory capacity for cell phones, for computers, for laptops, for this and that, you know, and every day it's all about who has the big, who has the latest chip that allows you to have more memory. Now, put that against the human, the human body, the human being. Imagine when you, you know, you're born and then when you're around 12 years old, oh, sorry, your memory is full. We need to upgrade you. Imagine that. Yeah. And so you can begin to appreciate how efficient and the body doesn't need any extra or whatever. That memory is so ridiculously efficient. And to me, that is, if we want to call it whoever the creation or whatever that created that thing, that is what we're still trying to get to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for those that try to, you know, I don't know the word for it, um, to make, uh, to, to, to question or to, to, to turn it into a transaction, it begins to actually um, betray how poor your mind is. But I'm not going to get into any more. Yeah, I want to I start. I want to, yes. I want to I wanna say thank you both. Um, and, and I think I'd, I'd like to clear that up by saying thank you for being able to see uh, beyond, uh, for being able to say, fuck that. I'm doing what's, what I want to do. And, and I'm inspiring the people that I want to inspire. And I think that raising products is, you guys are complete examples of stepping outside of the box and doing what the fuck you want to do where all the resistance was there. I want to just thank you. Uh, thank you for doing what you do. Like, I, I wish I had like two more hours and another six pack of Blue Moon uh, to do this. <laughs> Shut up. Uh, but I really uh, appreciate you guys. Design Museum, thank you so much for uh, creating a platform for this to happen. Um, I, I, I can't thank you enough, folks, for even when you didn't understand what the hell I was talking about, uh, for sticking with me um, and being here and always being there for me. Um, damn, I want to do this some more. Let's do more. <laughs> and then let's, let's keep going. Excited about the audience, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope that you will invite me to your talks um, and, and let's- Can I just say one thing to Obi? Yes. Obi, we, we have this thing, um, this expression in Mexico, I don't even know if it exists here, but uh, it's like, you, your words are like butter. <laughs> they just like, they're melting through my body right now. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people feel this way, but thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, it's, I think it's a passion that we all, thank you, thank you, first of all. Um, and I think, you know, it's the, um, I think it's the privilege to be naive, mm. you know, is what for me has uh, been the thing that has pushed me through spaces where if I had known what it meant, I would have shit in my pants and I would never have actually put my head through. But that, that's- Cheers it, for that. That, 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 that. Yeah, and that's for me, you know, one of the things, and I, and I, and I if I could wish that for everybody, oh, oh my God, cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, cheers. Cheers for naivety. Mm -hmm. And so from, I think, you know, like it's um, one of the things that allows, and I can say that in hindsight, you know, for you to actually consistently break rules, not because, that was your intent. It was just because you didn't know any better. And so you're constantly and perpetually under the fear that you might be, you might be discovered. Mm. Mm. And so that, that propels you 
to go and get it done right. And then now you have to compete and make it better than the next guy would have made it better. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, to me, I think um, it's been quite a, a fascinating, you know, journey and experience. Um, um, you know, uh, an acceptance actually, because you also have to be accepted. Of course, you know, yeah, you show promise and then people go with that. But then you have to continue to make that a normality for you and not something that is a job. It has to be normal, you know. And so, you know, but to me, you know, if I go back to this composition of this evening, um, like Norman had said, even Tara said earlier, uh, Phil, Paula, and Miss Design Museum of Chicago herself, you know, um, time we don't have enough of because the, uh, the, 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 the big problem, the big, the big conversation, so the big, uh, I, you know, uh, challenges of our time is handicapped by time itself, you know? Um, and that's one of the things that I think this period of pandemic, this corona, you know, uh, COVID-19, that forced humanity to, can I borrow your French word? To fucking stop and take a breather. Yes, use it. And realize <laughs> that instead of having a rat race, we should all be enjoying a snail race. Snail race. You know? Because then, all of a sudden, you're like, oh, holy shit. I didn't realize that brick has always been there. <laughs> well, it's been there. It's been all along. Now I can use that brick as a door stopper yeah. and let more air in and so forth, you know? And then you realize that, oh, wow, the world didn't implode because I didn't get to pay my mortgage. I didn't get to pay my rent. It didn't implode, you know? Suffering society and all whatnot, that's not the point I'm making. But the fact is, what are we, how are we going to see ourselves on the other side of tomorrow? And tomorrow is post this thing. Yeah. How do we see us? And so to me, I think these are questions that I think um, it will be fun for you guys to, um, to actually look into in your next sessions and stuff. Well, because not so much as designers, because I have a problem when we always are asking designers, we're empowering godless people, you know, people that are, we're empowering people to play God. When they're not. Mm. Come on. See, see, your designer is that guy that lives on the street, creating shelter, creating opportunities where the rest of us don't see nothing. Yeah. And they survive. Come on, man. You understand? Yeah. It's, it, you know, so for me, you know, I look and I'm like, you know, I think it's, it's high time we actually took a ladder that, you know, walked, came down the ladder. Mm. I start to see that actually theory is wonderful. Practice is amazing. Common sense yeah. trounces everything. Thank you so much, Obi. You're amazing. But that's all. Ken is going to beat me up in a minute. I know Lauren's about to push some buttons over there. <laughs> Never. Never. Um, no, that's beautiful. Uh, the audience and you guys. Uh, I don't, Tanner, I'm sure you want to close with some words. So I just, I, I'm down with thanking you guys and look forward to the next one. Yeah, that's, I just wanted to say thanks as well. I don't really have much else to say. Thanks to everybody here, Norman, uh, Foe, Paula, Obi, uh, our past panelists as well. There are tons of links in the program that's in the chat uh, to, to, to ways to support Chicago's artists and designers, some historic work. Uh, if you'd like to support the Design Museum, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash designmuseumshy. Um, thank you again to the Terra Foundation. We wouldn't be here without you, Terra Foundation. Um, but yeah, I just have nothing but praise and thanks. Uh, every conversation has raised the bar. And I think once we get around to 2.0, we're going to have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for supporting Raising Products okay. and Black House Studios. Yeah. So, did you want to say something? 
He's muted. Uh, just thank you to everybody, all of our speakers that we've had. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to the Design Museum, Terra Foundation, and thank you, Norman, for, you know, I know that you were like, well, I don't know if I want to moderate. I don't, I haven't done this that much. And um, don't you feel good? It I feel great. And I we all got to take risks. Let me drink while I moderate too. <laughs> we all got to take risks and jump in and do things that stretch us. So, I think thank you for stretching and thank you to everybody for joining in on this conversation and yeah. we hope to have some more Tanner, right? Yeah, I'm down. Yeah. Thank you, Catherine Darnstadt and Zoe Ryan. Uh, thank you, Johans. Uh, really Aaron, Aaron Hartney. Thank you, Aaron Hartney. Um, thank you, Paula. Thank you, Obi. I hope this is the beginning of something, um, something more than just talk because we're all doers. And I just look forward to doing something with you guys.